God is good, isn't he? God is good. Praise the Lord. I, I made the statement, if you were not here in Sunday school, you really missed the move of God this morning. Yeah. Whew, a powerful move of God in this place, the Shekinah glory of God. I saw him through the cloud that came in and the, uh, the work that he did here this morning. I tell you, God is still healing, delivering, and setting free. Do you know what brought it all on? One individual being obedient to God this Amen. morning. Yeah. Sister Carol E. back there coming up for prayer, and it just like it opened the windows of heaven, and God just moved. What a God that we have. Good to see you here this morning. Um, Tangie, I'm going to switch to this one. Sometimes that one, something about my voice, it messes it up out there. I don't know why. Praise the Lord. That's right. Whoo, Carly. She said over there too. Amen. But Emma and Donald sent a thank you card to the church for all the prayers for my family and the little sister in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and thanks to the church for all that they did. So I'll put that card right there on the board. I know we look like we're few this morning. We've, we've had a lot of people are out. Some are vacationing. I thank God Terry has been real sick. She sent the notice back here through Tangie that uh, she's doing better this morning, but she's been real sick. Tangie was on vacation. They came back a little bit early, so she'll be here to run the equipment for us. Janice's still on vacation. Uh, Eli is real sick. Stephanie's not feeling good, so that family is out this morning, except little David. Uh, his grandparents brought him. And Lord, I could just go on. Garrett's been really sick. We were to dedicate a baby today, the two children, but he's been running fever, and so they're not a. And I could go on and on and on, okay? But I'm not going to. We've got a lot of them out. But you know what? God knew exactly who was going to be here this morning, and I feel like He's given me a word this morning. And I, God has moved for the child of God this morning, and he's going to move in another direction in the ministry of the Word of God. But I wonder, do you have an urgent prayer request anywhere in the house that has not been already met anywhere? Okay. 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 That sounded like Carolee. She had a bone graft with hers. Somebody else? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. I thank you for the prayers for my son. He told me, Mom, I'm feeling better, and I know it's prayers. He's got a bunch of tests set up, but uh, the doctors say he has moderate COPD. But I tell you what, God says he's healed. So that's, that's what matters right there. Whose report are we going to believe this morning? Whose report? I choose to believe the report of God. Amen. Amen. He created us. Brother Brazel, he made our bodies, didn't he? Look what he brought you through. A devil tried to take you out, but it didn't work, did it? Woo! Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Amen. Good to see Lynn come in. Praise God this morning. All right, is there another request I may not have heard? The first team leaves on Tuesday, where's Will? Okay. Keep remembering Eugene. He's going to need our prayers. Unspoken requests, uplifting hands. God knows every hand. He knows all about it. And uh, we're going to go to prayer, and then we're going to have a song, and then we're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings after the song. So... Let's stand. If you're able, if you're not able now, you stay seated. You do not have to get up and down. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we're just so grateful to you this morning for all that you have done. Father, you're a healing God, a merciful, loving God, and I thank you for the move of your spirit in this house already, for the work that you have already done. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, mighty God, for you are a prayer-answering God. But, Lord, there are other needs that have been lifted up before you this morning, and we're believing, God, that you're reaching out and touching and healing, delivering and setting free. God, you are a healing God. 
For those that will love you and worship you and serve you, God, there's nothing you won't do. And we praise you in this house. Touch those that are going to be traveling overseas, God. Go before them, I pray. Touch our singers and our musicians this morning. Use them to plow up the hearts of the people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the church says, Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to have a song and... uh, you can sit or you can stand, whatever. Come on. I feel Jesus.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, ushers. They're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Strong in the front, too, Richard. Praise the Lord. I can feel Jesus in this place. He's been here this morning. He's touched us. I feel unworthy to come up and offer a part of an offering unto him. What can I give him compared to what he's already given to me? Nothing. But he desires our offerings and our tithes to help spread the word. And I thank you for his presence. I thank you for the spirit. There's a world out there that wish they could buy what we're experiencing right now. But it, you can't do it. It's free. It's free. Almighty God, Lord in heaven, we thank you for your presence. Yes, we feel your presence this morning. We see your presence on the face of your children. We open our hearts with tithes and offerings and give unto thee and humbly ask that you would bless it and use it to let this dark world know that you are alive and well, sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for each of us this morning. And the prayer requests that have gone up, up this morning, you have touched many that are here this morning. Have your way in this service, for we ask it in your name, Jesus, Lord and Savior. Amen. He is my everything.
serve. Children's church is turned loose. Praise God. I still feel the presence of God in this house. Woo, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, I give him glory in this house. I honor him in this house this morning. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. And I praise him. Right? You can stay seated this morning because of the way I'm going to do this. I'm going to do an introduction uh, before you put up the scriptures. And let me say this right here. I don't question what God gives me to minister. Sometimes I don't always understand everything. But I'm not questioning him this morning. Two or three days ago, I'd given Terry some scriptures, and I said, Terry, this is what I feel like I'm going to be ministering on Sunday morning. Then Wednesday night, I, I began, all that day, God dealt with me. He has dealt with me and dealt with me, and I believe it was on Thursday. I said, I've got to obey God, and I, I sent Terry some different scriptures. I said, God has changed my message. This is what he wants for Sunday morning. And then I see such a move of God in the house. But this is what God told me to minister. And the title of the message is The Value of a Soul. The Value of a Soul. And I've asked you just remain seated. Let me pray. I'll give an introduction. Then we can finish on with the scriptures. Father, I thank you this morning for what you've already done in this house. Yes, Lord. You've done a mighty work here, Lord. Yes, Lord. But God, there's still a work to be done. Yes, and I need your help. I need your wisdom. I need your knowledge. But above all else, God, your anointed word. Yes. That as it goes forth, conviction would flow in this house to every ear that hears. And that this will be the day that lives will be changed and a difference will be made. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The church says, Amen. Let me give you a little bit of background. This We're going to be reading from Mark chapter 8. And in the book of Mark, there has been miracles that have taken place in this chapter. There has been the multiplying of the loaves and the fishes where they have fed the multitudes that had come to hear Jesus as he ministered the word. And right after that, it talks about the healing of a blind man that had taken place in the same chapter. And then the next thing, Jesus goes with his disciples. And they're headed toward Caesarea Philippi. And they're on the wall, uh, a road and they're walking there. And as they are walking, Jesus asked a question to his disciples. And he says unto them, Whom do men say that I am? 
And several of it said they answered him. Several of them gave him an answer about who men say that he is. Some of them say you're John the Baptist. Some of them say you're Elias. That was Elijah. In the other Gospels it said some of them even say you're Jeremiah the prophet and so on and so forth. But then Jesus says to his disciples after he gets those answers, and he says to his disciples again, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter is the one who answers for the entire group. And he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And he tells Peter, he said, I say unto you that thou art Peter. Peter's name means rock or little rock. Thou art Peter. And he says, upon this rock I will build my church. Not upon Peter, but on the rock of revelation knowledge that Peter had said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. When you accept that into your life, then the church is being built. And he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Jesus tells them, when he says that to Peter, he begins to talk to his disciples, and he says unto them, I am going to go to the cross, I paraphrase, I am going to die, but in three days I am going to rise again. And Peter, who had just heard the voice of God speak and tell him who Jesus was, takes Jesus aside and rebukes Jesus. Can you imagine that? And he told him, Not so, Lord, be it not unto you. This is not going to happen to you. You're not going to die, so on and so forth. And Jesus looks back at Peter, and what he's doing is looking at Satan speaking through Peter, and he says unto them, Get thee behind me, Satan. For you savor not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. And that right there is where the scriptures pick up that I'm about to read in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. Go ahead, Tangy. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he says unto them, Whosoever will come after me, in other words, you're going to follow me, let him deny himself, that's his flesh, that worldliness, take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. In other words, if you refuse to do that, I just want to live my own way, then you're going to lose your life in the end. But whoever shall lose his life for my sake, for the sake of Jesus, and the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man or a woman, that's mankind, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Verse 36 is where I take my text from. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I want to talk to you this morning 
And you see, I'm not getting in a big way because this is very important. This is something that needs to be heard. I'll not keep you too long this morning, but I must obey God. And I want to talk to you, as I said, about the value of the soul. And I wonder, we as human beings, have we ever counted the cost if your soul should be lost? Do you know that when God made you, that he breathed into your nostrils the breath of life and you became a living soul? And do you know this morning that you are made in the image of God? You are not just a body. What I am looking at this morning is not the real you. Inside of you, there is a spirit and there is a soul and it lives in this body that I am looking at. And this body one day will die and it's going to be put in the ground somewhere and it's going to go back to ashes. But the soul and the spirit that was made in the image of God will last for eternity. Once you are conceived in your mother's womb, you are alive forevermore. When the sun and the moon and the stars have fallen out of their orbits and the sun has become cinders and time shall be no more, our soul will still be in existence somewhere either in heaven or in a place called hell. Timeless, dateless, measureless. Your soul will exist forever and ever and ever. And that is why the Lord Jesus Christ asked the question in Mark 8 and 36. Listen to it again because this is the question to each of us that is listening here today. This is to the backslider. This is to the sinner. And this is to the Christian because you have not yet arrived. For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Brother Richard brought it out in what little Sunday school he got to talk about this morning. And he pulled out a dollar or two out of his pocket. He said, this is what mankind worships. Man is worshiping the God of money. The God of money, and they don't care who they have to hurt, who they have to walk over top of, what they have to do. They want that dollar bill, and that's all they care about. They don't care about me or you or anybody else just getting that money into their pocket. And like Brother Richard said, they have no concept that when we get over in glory, we're going to walk on streets that are made out of gold. Uh, honey, you can't take that money with you. There's nothing on this earth that you can take with you except what you give away. I hope y'all heard that. It's only what you give away and give it with the right motive and the right heart that you're going to be rewarded for on the other side of eternity. But as we think about the value of a soul, I want to look at the worth of our soul. What makes our soul so valuable? What makes your soul worth more than even this whole world that we live in? And to answer that, the worth of anything can be measured by several different factors. And I want to talk about three of them this morning. One, first of all, is who made it? Who designed it? Who created it? That's the first one. I put those three together, but that's number one. And as you were made in the image of Almighty God, Genesis 2 and 7 says the Lord and Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth. And I've quoted this, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Amen. I read that one of the rarest and the finest paintings to mankind in this world is, I, I think his name is Raphael, Raphael. They, he, he painted something called Madonna. You know that woman sitting in that rocking chair looks like she's asleep. Y'all know who I'm talking about. But, and why was, why did he do it? Why was it so great? Because it was a handiwork of a great artist. He was a great artist. You were made this morning in the image of God and you are the crowning work of God's creation. 
the God who made the rainbows and the flowers and set the sun and the moon and the stars and the vast spaces out there. The finished work of his entire creation was mankind. And not only is something valuable because of who made it, but it's valuable because of the demand for who wants it. There is a battle going on in the heavenlies for your soul this morning. Even as I am preaching here, there are angels of God that are fighting for your soul. And there are the demon forces of hell that are battling to try to stop you from giving your heart to God. And I don't care how expensive something is. If nobody wants it, it's not worth a hoot. There's got to be a demand for it. But there is a battle being fought. And that battle is intensifying, children of God. And the closer we get to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the harder it is going to be to get to God. Today is the day of salvation. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. There's no promise you can walk out the door of this church and even be alive before you hit the parking lot. My Lord, why do you think that we fight the demon forces of hell as we preach as we sing the songs of Zion up here, as we plead with Christians and, and to be prayed up, please pray before you come to church. Pray for the service. Pray for the one that's in the pulpit. Pray for that one that's singing the songs who, who paves the way that you can receive the Lord into your heart. But most people come in nonchalant. They don't think a thing about praying. They pay no attention to it whatsoever. They don't care about souls being saved or not saved. Never bothering to intercede in prayer or crying out to God on behalf of those that are ministering or the lost souls that are sitting in the pews. Hallelujah to God. We better wake up, church. We better realize this morning what this thing is all about because it's your loved ones that might be dropping into eternity lost next. Hallelujah. Your soul is so valuable that the Son of God died to redeem it. He left heaven. He stripped himself of his God qualities. He laid him aside and he come down here and took upon himself the flesh of mankind. And he ended up beaten and bruised and you name it. And he gave his life. He was unrecognizable as a human being by the time they got done with him. But he did it to pay my sin debt and pay your sin debt. But you have got to accept that. Your soul is valuable. The Son of God died to redeem it. First Peter 1 and 18 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Do you know how valuable your soul is? The worth of a soul? Do you want to know? Climb up to heaven. Put your ear upon the bleeding heart of God and listen to him say, I love you. I love you. I love you. I gave my son's life for you. Come down to the blood-drenched slopes of Calvary and see Jesus as he sheds his own blood in agony for us. Go a little bit lower down into the pits of hell of that burning pit and see him as he walks the corners of hell. See him as he suffers on that cross and the midnight despair that he went through. Look at that cross. You were not redeemed with corruptible things. Your soul is worth more than a billion, than 19 billion, than 50 billion, than a trillion. My friend, your soul is valuable. And your soul is valuable not only because of who made it and because of the demand for it, but it's valuable because of its durability. When I go buy me a pair of shoes or I buy myself a dress or I need a wash machine or whatever I might need and I have to go buy that thing, you know the first thing I want to look at 
What's a, what's the quality of this thing? What's it made out of? How long is this going to have to last me? Do I got to come around, turn around next year and buy me another one? You know, we want to know how long is it going to last. Child of God, and you that are here, how long is eternity? How long is eternity? I gave a story one time. Richard refers to it real often. He, he tries to refer to it. But let me tell you a little story. And you use your imagination just to illustrate how long eternity is. And I heard this story one time when I was a young girl. Imagine a little gentle dove. A little bird. And it's going to fly from earth to the moon. And it takes it 100,000 years to get there. And then it takes 100,000 years for it to return back to the earth. But while it is there, it dips down over the surface of the moon. And with just the feathery tip of the wing of that little dove, it brushes the surface of the moon. And when that dove has completed enough trips that the moon would be totally worn away by the tip of its little wing, eternity will only just have begun. Do y'all hear me? Friend of mine, your soul, a million years, a billion years, a trillion years from now, will still be in existence. The Bible does not teach the annihilation of the soul. Your soul will exist forever. And not only is your soul de durable, but your soul is rare. Do you know that you are one of a kind? And that soul is the only one you'll ever have. If you die lost, there's not another. There is no such thing as reincarnation. You are God's special creature. He loves you. He has a special plan for your life here upon this earth and for eternity to come. And there's only, i say it again, there's only one you. What shall it profit a man? To gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Well, Sister Luke, how do I lose my soul? What do I have to do to lose my soul? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You just sit there and do nothing and you will lose your soul. Because like it or not, God gave you the freedom of choice. And he said, choose you this day whom you will serve. And he said, today is the day of salvation. And he said, you have no promise of tomorrow. He does have foreknowledge of what we're going to do. And, but he gives us a choice. And he does everything in his power to give you an opportunity to accept the shed blood to cover your sins. But the choice is still yours. He will not force you. You have got to choose of a free will. I was reading many years ago about an archaeologist and they had opened the uh, tomb of a great king. It was uh, Charlemagne the Great, something like that. And it was in the 8th or ninth century. And when they went in there, he ruled France, that king did. And when they went into that lavish tomb area, they said that it was like a, a huge throne room. As a matter of fact, it had a throne setting in it. Very lavish. And they found the treasure, some of the treasures of France. And it was in this tomb. And they found it and brought it out there. And they had, they had in no, that time of, of, you know, the ages, some way or other they had embalmed that king when he died. And not only that, they set him on that throne. In a, you know, a king's position. And they said that when they went in there, 
that the flesh had decayed, de you know, naturally it decayed, and all it was was the bones that were left. There was no flesh there whatsoever. But on one bony finger, there was a ring there, a king's ring. He had a sepulcher in that hand. And a crown had been upon his head, but where the flesh had decayed, it had dropped down over that skull. Part of the way it was crooked on his skull. But in the other hand, they had laid a parchment thing with the New Testament that, had, by the way, was uh, first uh, written down in the 5th century. This was the 8th or 9th century. And that, that New Testament was there, and one bony finger of that other hand was pointed to a scripture in the Bible, and it was the exact scripture that I read to you. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Friend, Life is like a vapor. You're here today and it's gone tomorrow. This world and all that this world possess will never satisfy the deep longings of your soul. Only Jesus can do that. And your choice to serve him must be made on this side of eternity. Because if you die lost, there is no purgatory that people can light a candle and pray you out of there. You'll not be able to go before the great white throne judgment of God and be pulled out of hell and stand before him on that day of judgment and say, oh, I understand it now. Now I'll serve you. Forgive me now. It's too late. It's too late. It's appointed unto man. I've said it once to die. And after this, the judgment. Now you listen to the heart of this preacher. And I'm going to tell you plain. And I'm going to tell it to you straight. If you want God's love, you can have it. If you want his mercy, you can have it. If you want his forgiveness to be saved today, you can have it. But you listen to me. It would do you no good to come to the judgment seat and say, God, have mercy on me. There will be no mercy and no forgiveness at that time. I've illustrated it. I've said it so many times in my preaching. Right now in the portals of heaven, there is a mercy seat that's covered by the blood of Jesus. When Jesus came off of that cross, he was in the garden and Mary went to touch him. He said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto my Father. He had to take his blood and take it into the portals of glory and put his blood upon the mercy seat in heaven. By that evening he had done it But right now the, God's looking down And when he sees judgment That should be on us Instead the blood is there the blood is covering our sins on the mercy seat. Mercy is still alive for you right now. And he's looking down through the mercy seat of the blood. But according to Revelation... The way it pictures Jesus when he's coming back. There is coming a day soon. It could even be today that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is going to go to the portals of heaven and he's going to go over and take off his vesture, the Bible says, and wipe the blood off of that mercy seat. And God would no longer be looking down through mercy and he's coming back and the trump of God is going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise and when he wipes it away the Bible says there shall be poured out wrath without mercy Judy you slip up here hallelujah there is coming a time when those who die lost and they go to hell there's coming a time, one time, Brother Richard, when they're going to actually be summoned out of hell. We say once you get to hell, there's no getting out. One time, 
One time you'll come out of the portals of hell, but you won't want to come. You won't want to come because you're going, you'll know you're going to be called before the beam of seat of Christ, the judgment seat, the great white throne judgment. And the Bible said when that takes place, you're going to be judged and then you will be cast into the eternal lake of fire that will burn forever and ever and ever. I'm not trying to give you a scared gospel this morning. I am giving you the word of God. Revelation 20 and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, stand before God. And the books were open, which is a book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Stand all over the house if you're able. And it says the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Verse 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Friend of mine, your soul is valuable. It is up to you where you spend eternity. It's up to you where you spend eternity. There is a place called hell. Where the fire, the Bible said, is never quenched. And the worm, that word for worm is your soul, never dieth. He said there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There is a place called heaven that God has prepared to keep you out of that place. I want every head bowed. Backslider, it's not too late to come back to God. How do I get there, Sister Luke? You say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me. I I know you saved me, but over the years I've gone back on you. I'm not where I need to be. Would you take me back to the Father's house? And he said, "Any, any man that would come unto him, he said, I will in no wise cast you out. It's only a few, the Bible says, that's going to find heaven. He said, the way is narrow, the road is narrow. A few there be that follow. But he said, the way is broad, and it's a road of destruction for those who go to hell. Do you know this morning that hell was never created for mankind? It was originally created for the devil and his angels. But because of the wickedness of man... Man chooses over top of God and they choose to live in sin. And because of that, hell is enlarging itself daily. With every head bowed and nobody looking around, I want to give you an opportunity this morning. If you're here and if you're a sinner or you're a backslider, this is your morning. You're not here by accident. You didn't come because somebody asked you to come. You came because the Spirit of God is calling you. You wouldn't have had any determination to even come into the house of God if He wasn't drawing you. He's drawing you. He loves you. He wants to, he wants to touch you. He wants to help you through your situations in life. Is there one here this morning? Just lift your hand and say, Sister Luke, pray for me. Thank you for that hand. Is there another? Thank you for that hand. Is there another? I tell you what, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I will not go back and pull you up here. I will not do that. But I want to give you an opportunity. Would you come? Would you come and stand at this altar? Would you come? Would you come? Stand at this altar and say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you, but the richer you come. 
Brother Richard. Come on, you preachers. Come on, you preachers. Is there another? What about that other hand that went up? You say, well, I love you, God, but not where I need to be with God. All you got to do is walk down and say, forgive me.